Hello, thanks so much for having me. I'm here reporting on joint work with Erica Peterson from Stanford Linguistics, though Erica shouldn't be held accountable for my opinionated takes or silly literary illusions. She should, though, get the credit for the hard-nosed, deep, insightful lexical semantics I'll be reporting on. Our title is Lexical Semantics in the Time of Large Language Models, which is meant to be a very highbrow literary illusion, but let me begin where I often begin these days with Joe Pater's excellent paper in language titled Generative Linguistics and Neural Networks at 60, and this will help me explain our title. So Joe opens his paper with this line, which is referring to Chomsky and Rosenblatt. At the beginning of 1957, two men nearing their 29th birthdays published work that laid the foundation for two radically different approaches to cognitive science. Now, linguistics might have allied itself with Rosenblatt, but of course Chomsky's vision was seen as compelling, and so it wasn't to be. But Joe really eloquently articulates why linguistics and neural network research have wonderful potential for common ground and common cause. He writes, when viewed from a sufficient distance, neural network and generative linguistic approaches to cognition overlap considerably. They both aim to provide formally explicit accounts of the mental structures underlying cognitive processes, and they both aim to explain how those structures are learned. So now we can understand our title as an allusion, of course, to the classic novel Love in the Time of Cholera. We worked very hard on this poster for the talk. In Love in the Time of Cholera, Florentino and Fermina are secretly in love in their youth. They're forced apart and end up leading lives so different that their early bond becomes impossible to fully recall. They eventually find their way back to each other and fall back in love, accepting, though, that this will always be a complicated love given their very different pasts. So in meme-like fashion, we've been very clear here about the roles. Lexical semantics and maybe all of linguistics is Fermina. In her youth, she briefly loved Florentino, aka connectionism, but it wasn't to be. So she settled for formal logic, Dr. Urbino here. And we've modified the tagline for the movie. I don't want you to overlook this. How long would you wait for complete meaning representations? Okay, let's dive in. The star of our show is going to be the English verb break. Break and burt, I suppose. In linguistics, break is really well studied because it is, it is like the canonical instance of a verb that undergoes the causative alternation. You have the linguist broke the window and also the window broke, where the theme argument, the window, has been promoted to subject position. This alternation also gives linguists a chance to think about agentivity, since example one might lead you to an agentive inference for the linguist, but that's not entailed, and examples like the hurricane broke the window seem to show that it can be missing. So this is all good stuff, but we need to break out of the trap of thinking that this is the full story for break. It definitely is not. Let's go deeper. Yes, we have break the vase, where the sense is something like shatter. We also have break the computer, where the meaning is different, more like render inoperable. Break the news is different yet again. To break the news is to reveal it in some way. If you break the silence, then you interrupt the silence. If you break the record, then you surpass the record. On the other hand, if you break the code, then you decipher it. If you break a horse, you probably tamed it. If you break a $10 bill, you do something very particular with it. You make change. When you break a fall, you lessen it somehow. And if you break the law, you violate it, a transgression. These are all transitive uses. We also have some obligatory intransitive ones, like the weather broke, which means the weather changed. And we have the day broke, which means it began. And I haven't even gotten to the verb particle constructions. If you break off the engagement, you end it. If you break out in hives, it means you are suddenly afflicted by hives. If you can break into a building, that means you intrude. If you break down a problem, though, you analyze it. And those are the transitive cases. We have a bunch of intransitive cases, various predicates like break in, break free, break even, break forth, break to the right, break out. And I'm sure this isn't comprehensive, but this is already a lot. When we think about doing lexical semantics, we should be thinking about all of this complexity and trying to characterize it and identify its extent and track down its origins and all of that. Now, within lexical semantics, one important angle people have taken on this problem involves assessing which verbs undergo the causative alternation that I mentioned before, or more generally, which versions are obligatorily transitive which are obligatorily intransitive, 
and which allow for alternations between the two. For example, the uses in this first block are alternating. Alongside the transitive cases we've listed, we have intransitive ones like the vase broke, the news broke, and, and the silence broke. In the next block, we have the transitive only cases. For example, you can't say the law broke or the $10 bill broke. If you reflect on your intuitions, you might feel some uncertainty around the boundary here for cases like the record broke and the code broke. Don't worry, that's natural. We'll, we'll return to that later. We might indeed want to reframe this to be less about what's possible in some strict sense and make it more about what's required of the construction to make it, say, an intransitive use. Our final group is the intransitive only cases like the weather broke. You simply can't say Zeus broke the weather or we broke free the jail. The intransitive cases just can't be transitive, it seems, and the particle constructions all require the internal argument to be introduced with a preposition, as in we broke free from the jail. And ones like break out, as in fighting broke out, seem just not to have even those quasi-transitive uses. Incidentally, for all these intransitive cases, it's common to explain them by way of the unaccusativity hypothesis. We say that these uh, constructions are underlyingly actually more like transitive cases without a subject, and the subject we do see is underlyingly playing a theme-like role semantically, and that of course blocks the introduction of a second theme. The semantic role is already occupied. Okay, obviously these argument structure details are just one small aspect of these lexical entries. To keep things manageable here, we're mostly going to set aside the particle and predicative break constructions from here on out and focus on the simpler examples that we've given on this slide. What kinds of features can we identify and study here? Well, we've touched on the argument structure features already. We could break down the verbs we're looking at based on whether they allow transitive uses and whether they allow intransitive uses, with the alternating cases then emerging as the verbs that appear in both constructions. We could also ask which meanings are metaphorical and which are literal. This is a common question to ask, but a very difficult one to answer in the details. Maybe we can agree that break the vase is non-metaphorical, but even break the computer is tricky. Uh, is it a second sense or a metaphor that builds on shattering? Or is there even a fact of the matter here? Maybe break the news and break a $10 bill are clearly metaphorical, but drawing a firm boundary is going to be very difficult, even if we allow ourselves a very rich feature space for doing this. My own preference would be to take the entire semantic space as it is and try to understand its fixed uses and those that can arise with creative language use and not worry about metaphorical or not. Another feature we could think about is the event classes. That's what I've been using informally with these paraphrases that I've been giving in parentheses. Now, we could hope to find a smaller stock of meaning classes that cover all the spaces of use, or we could simply treat these as semantic associations that might have multiple dimensions and create multiple connections to the rest of the lexicon. Another thing to consider would be the status of the argument or arguments to the verb. Do they need to be animate or eventive or agentive and so forth? And I think there are many, many other dimensions that we could consider taking stock of as part of our lexical semantic analysis of a verb like break. So I definitely don't mean this to be exhaustive here. And indeed, our core question is sort of whether we could ever hope to enumerate all of the dimensions worth measuring, even for a sim single verb like break. All right, now I hope you have a sense for our target verb, break, the star of our show. With these observations in mind, let's consider the sort of approaches that have been taken to these lexical semantic questions within linguistics. I realize that people think linguists are always disagreeing with each other, but this is actually going to reveal a lot of consensus, I think. So to start, we'll think about feature-based analyses. Not all linguists explicitly create feature spaces like the one that you see here, since many papers are largely about individual feature dimensions or interactions. But I think it's fair to say that this kind of language we're using here captures what they're after. So we've got readings under the example column, represented by specific examples, and then we have tabulated features. We got the transitive and intransitive ones that I mentioned before. You can see already that I'm not a fan of this metaphorical idea since I really couldn't figure out how to code that column, but there it is. We've listed out the senses as a sort of meaning classes, and we did a rough characterization of the internal arguments here uh, according to their semantics. For example, we could have annotations like inanimate entity, device, and state. 
And of course, we might want to split this column out into a full feature decomposition of these phrases to capture their multidimensional nature. Now, feature-based analyses like this can be a very rich store of lexical knowledge, and they could be the basis for further study as we notice latent correlations and other associations in the space that we've created. What I want to do is tease out a few things that are relevant for the theme of this workshop. And these things may be obvious, but it's worth stating them and getting them into our discourse common ground for the workshop. The first is that this feature space is a vector space analysis. Any decomposition of features, if given precisely, is going to be expressible as a vector space model of some sort. So these things are absolutely pervasive in science. And here, in the case of lexical semantics, I think this connection with vector spaces is truly meaningful for the work that we want to do. First, in all likelihood, the names we give the columns are just for us. To the extent that these columns have meaning in the context of our theory, it's going to come from the relationships of the items in these columns and how those values interact with other values in other columns. And that's just what we mean when we talk about representational spaces as embedding spaces. And it's just as true here as it is for NLP and the other stuff we'll consider later. Second, it seems very unlikely that we'll ever find all the dimensions that we want to include in this analysis. At any rate, we just know for certain that the current picture on this slide isn't even anywhere near to being complete. Now, in saying this, I might sound like a pessimist, but you could cast this as the opposite. The lexicon is incredibly intricate and multidimensional. And relatedly, I think we can all accept that the feature names we're using for these meaning classes are not primitives that reduce to the values in these columns. When we name a column like this, we're intending to evoke much more structure than is reflected in the values, right? We surely want to decompose these things into lots of columns with numerous different dimensions. And so these symbols we're using here are either temporary stand-ins for something much deeper, or they're hooks into the wider world of the full conceptual and lexical space that our theory is situated in. Using existing hand-built resources, we can even go deeper than this feature space. To give you a sense for this, we did some exploration of break in WordNet, which has a very rich picture of break. The, the lemma break participates in something like 60 synsets in WordNet. So we built a graph of the synsets using the hypernym graph provided by WordNet. And the resulting graph has 29 connected components, that is 29 subgraphs. And here we're showing just the four largest of them, and we put the rest on an appendix slide, though it's a bit unwieldy. Anyway, I think this is really interesting. We've labeled each of these subgraphs with their most specific shared hypernym. So this one is labeled cause to change, make different, cause a transformation. Whereas this next one is subtly different, undergo a change, become different in essence, lose one's or its nature. And so this is like the first one, but with the agentivity bleached from it. The third one is have or possess, either in a concrete or an abstract sense. I suppose this is senses like break the bank and break my wallet. And finally, perform an action or work out or perform. This seems to be encompassing break the news style things as well as ones involving transgressions. Anyway, I think this is all great. These common hypernyms definitely capture new dimensions through these senses that we didn't even consider before. I don't think they're truly the essence of the senses or anything, since that may not even be sensible to try to find, but rather I think they plausibly capture some new latent meaning dimensions that are likely to be valuable. For instance, they might have predictive force that we could test experimentally by asking people what they take to be the entailments or non-negotiable commitments of utterances involving these different senses, and that would be a test of whether these are actually latent dimensions. Stepping back though, let me just mention a few things to summarize. A graph is a vector space. This one is larger, richer, and sparser than the one that we just looked at, but it's still nowhere near comprehensive. There's a lot we still need to uncover. There's a second insight from linguistics that I want to pull out. When we think about doing these analyses, we should live by the motto, always the phrase, never just the lexical item. David Doughty's 1976 book was influential in establishing this in the context of diagnosing aspect. Doughty writes, Venler's attempt to classify surface verbs once and for all as activities or accomplishments is somewhat misguided. First, we have just seen not just verbs, but in fact whole verb phrases must be taken into account. 
I feel this is a point of consensus throughout linguistics at this point. And then Hagit Borer really took it to the limit in her series of books called Structuring Sense. In book one, she writes of open class lexical items that they do not have any formal properties and are in a sense tantamount to raw material, stuff, which is poured into the structural mold to be assigned grammatical properties. So on this view, the lexemes of the language are all potentials. They're vessels waiting to be fleshed out based on the context. They may provide some constraints on how they can ultimately be read, but they're in some sense at the mercy of what's happening around them. A second theme that we want to surface here concerns polysemy. Um, these might be more controversial takes than those first ones, so we won't assert that they represent the consensus, but they seem to follow from positions like those of Barrer and reflect the data that we've seen. First, Herb Clark seeks to argue that we should reject the dogma of sense selection, which says that listeners determine an innumerable set of senses for each expression, and in understanding what a speaker means, they select the appropriate sense from that set. What he argues for is something like what Borer imagines, I think, plus maybe a lot more interaction and pragmatics and usage and all that. And Clark is saying here that word meanings are arrived at in a fluid way via reasoning about the context and about each other, and so we can't assume a fixed stock of meanings a priori. He is rejecting this dogma. And the evidence that he gives here is largely focused on coercion, where familiar words are being used in new contexts, leading to new but still stable meanings. And I'm going to return to that later since it's relevant, I think, for judgments around uh, different senses of break. Second, Pustoyevsky's generative lexicon really embraces this idea. This is a quotation from an overview article on the generative lexicon and its goals. Pustoyevsky writes, Rather than taking a snapshot of language at any moment of time and freezing it into lists of word sense specifications, the model of the lexicon proposed here does not preclude extensibility. It is an open-ended in nature and accounts for the novel creative uses of words in a variety of contexts by positing procedures for generating semantic expressions for words on the basis of particular contexts. So I think Pustoyevsky imagines formal constraints on the sense-making process where I think Clark is assuming that the only constraints are those of intelligibility and communication. But this is perhaps incidental relative to the core shared insight here. So I'll be so bold as to summarize all of this under the heading of a consensus view in linguistics. We have some lexical meanings here given with a finite number of meaning dimensions, which I've signified with these partly underspecified vectors of feature values. We have break and we have the vase to keep it simple. Alone, these values are largely unspecified. When they come together to form a verb phrase, a bunch of the values get specified, and we might even allow, as I've indicated here, that some of the initial values might actually change. Then we get a grammatical subject, and that brings in its own elements and affects its own process of changing of the initial values. And we could continue without restriction as new words are added to the sentence, and I think we can all accept that bringing in the context of use might bring in a lot more changes and refinements and so forth. So the more we add, the more the values shift around, we get more and different information about the words, and in turn about the overall meaning of the sentence on a particular occasion of use. With these ideas in mind, I can't resist checking out a few cases that really fascinate me. The first is discussed in Levine and Rappaport Hovav's classic 1995 book, Unaccusativity. Ask yourself, can you say the leaves are deteriorating the roof? There is perhaps something unexpected about this construction, and I think it's a rare use of deteriorate in this transitive sense, but we can all immediately see what it means. Second, the investments are deteriorating. Uh, this example may have been pointed out to me by Chris Manning, or else I suggested it to him. I, I can't quite recall. Uh, anyway, maybe you've never heard these two phrases used together before, and so different dimensions of the meanings are being activated than you're used to. But the sense-making process is, again, pretty easy. We all know that this sentence means the values of the investments are going down. Here's a more subtle one that Erica found. There's a sort of consensus in the literature that break in the sense of decipher is obligatorily transitive, and we said as much at the start of the talk. We've put an asterisk here on the secret code broke to indicate this view that such things aren't allowed. But Erica found this one, which is a description of code breaking in World War II. 
Almost 60 years later, Frank Rowlett, a cryptologic pioneer and head of the Purple Team, remembered that historic day when the code broke. So that's an intransitive use, and I, I think it works. It does something that seems deliberate. It bleaches the example of the agentivity that the transitive sentence, our team broke the code, would definitely have. The result is that the deciphering appears almost like an inevitability, the result of some kind of natural force or process. Here's one more. This was found for us by Dan Lassiter. The Guinness World Record broke, our furniture didn't. So this strikes us as some fun wordplay involving a mixture of senses that cut across a normal constructional boundary between those senses. And it seems deliberate, and we should definitely not marginalize cases like this. It's one of the wonders of language use that we can play around in this way and still have all of the senses kind of hang together. All right, let's begin to summarize the linguistic picture a bit. I'll be so bold as to assert that we have consensus that lexical meanings are high dimensional and modulated by the linguistic and discourse context. For the high dimensional part, I'll just refer to all the discoveries about dimensions of meaning and their distribution. For contextual modulation, I'd note that researchers as diverse intellectually as Dowdy, Borer, Clark, and Pustyovsky are all on my side here. Two more controversial issues, which I've called open questions for now. I think linguists right now tend to assume that lexical meanings contain discrete structured dimensions and also meaningfully exist independent of their tokens. As we move into newer NLP methods, it's gonna be harder and harder to maintain this discrete structured dimensions bit. But perhaps linguists would welcome that, assuming they can give up their love of symbolic logic a little bit. For the second part, well, we haven't really touched on this, and I'm sure most linguists would say, of course words meaningfully exist independent of their tokens, and they might point to dictionaries and other resources as evidence for that. Sure, but let me just throw this out there. Here I have an animated GIF that scrolls through the Wiktionary entry for break. It's an impressively long entry and lists dozens of senses, surely more than we've enumerated in this talk so far. More important, though, is the observation that tons of the information in this entry is conveyed only by example senses and very informal supporting paraphrases. And you kind of get the feeling that for any new example, we could motivate the idea that it involves a different sense from any that are already listed. And in this way, we might start to shake your confidence that there's a meaningful prototype to extract from all of this as opposed to a loose assemblage of raw materials for diverse usage situations. But let me now truly summarize in a conservative way. Boldly speaking for all linguists, I'll venture that we have broad agreement that word meanings are high dimensional, modulated by context, and do involve discrete structured dimensions and exist independent of their tokens. That's how I've taken stock of the linguistics literature. Let's turn now to some modern NLP perspectives on all of this. We'll start with static vector representations and then move to contextual ones. And here again, I want to review some things that I think we all know at some level, but that are rarely discussed very directly. To make this simple, let's imagine that I've posed for myself a simple word level sentiment classification task. I've got this data set over here with posneg labels for words like awful, disappointing, nice, and awesome. Good. All right, so now you give me four new words whose identities I don't know, and you say, okay, what are the labels for these? Well, obviously I'm stuck. This is a hopeless learning scenario because this data set over here offers no potential for generalization. That's pretty obvious because we've not made an effort to represent the examples with features or anything, so of course there's no chance for abstraction. But this problem can arise even when we have feature representations, and it will arise very forcefully if we try to pose a hard generalization task for ourselves without really reflecting on what we're doing, right? Suppose I add four feature dimensions to the data set, but then I set things up so that my train set on the left will contain one kind of example and my test set on the right will contain another. This might mean that the feature representations are such that the trained data set cannot even in principle provide information about the test set. Features F3 and F4 are all zero in the train set and those so those parameters are gonna to remain totally random throughout the training process, leading to random predictions. 
We don't need an experiment to tell us that in this case, because the feature spaces are so absurdly distinct for train and test, but subtler versions of this can arise whenever we have these very highly structured hand-built feature spaces. And so that finally brings us to the distributional ideas that are behind all of the current day NLP models. Instead of designing features by hand, we'll just keep track of which words tend to co-occur with which other words, and we might do this in very sophisticated ways. But in the simplest case, we can just count these co-occurrence patterns. Here I've illustrated with two column dimensions, co-occurrences with the word excellent and horrid. The count values here are entirely realistic. The negative words tend to occur with horrid and hardly at all with excellent, and the positive words show the opposite association. And these associations are even scaled in some sense based on how intuitively negative or positive the target words are. At test time, I just need that same co-occurrence data, and then even, as you can see here, a very trivial, even rule-based model will do perfectly on this test set. So this is a very promising learning scenario. We can easily gather the needed data, and we're very unlikely to suffer from the sort of problematic feature spaces that I pointed out before, even if we decide to pose really hard generalization tasks for ourselves. The reason we're likely to be robust to such things is partly just the richness of this distributional data, but I want to emphasize that it also traces to the very powerful models that we're likely to be using here in 2022. These are models that can capture higher order notions of co-occurrence that can be very abstract. Here I've called this neighbors of neighbors of neighbors of neighbors with no end in sight, only weakening notions of what it means to be in the neighborhood. To expand on what I mean here, let's consider this very simple vector space where I've exaggerated everything so that a one means co-occurs and a blank cell means never co-occurs, just so we can think about this analytically. Now, in my example, delectable and melodious never co-occur in this hypothetical case. Both are positive, but the first is used in the food domain, let's stipulate, and the second in the music domain. Can we capture their abstract notion of similarity? For modern models, yes. Because both words co-occur with good, they are second order neighbors of each other. And so that will create some distributional similarity for them. How about fab as in fabulous? It's very informal. It co-occurs directly with super, which is also informal. Super is similar to good, and so fab has similarity to good as well. And as a result, we even get that fab has some similarity to delectable and melodious, which might be a third order notion of being a neighbor. In this respect, models like PCA, LSA, LSI, GloVe, and Word2Vec and autoencoders are vastly superior to simple count reweighting methods like PMI and TFIDF. All these more modern methods perform a dimensionality reduction that allows them to capture these higher order notions of similarity that I'm pointing out here. And this results in really robust and very richly structured, dense feature representations. So this is all very rich and inspiring, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. How do models like this do in terms of delivering insights for our star, the verb break? Well, this is a little bit of a letdown in my view. Here's a high dimensional visual visualization of a glove embedding space trained on data from the common crawl. The space itself has a lot of rich structure, but the area around break seems sort of diffuse and bland, right? The model did cluster all the morphological variants like break, broke, and breaking, which is reassuring to be sure, but their neighbors seem like a mixture of synonyms for some of the senses of break like stop, as well as collocational stuff like backs and other random things that you can see here. You might worry that our 2D visualization of this otherwise 300 dimensional space is distorting things in a negative way, but here are the direct neighbors of break according to cosine similarity, and it looks very similar, similarly bland and diffuse. So what's the problem? Well, I reckon that a big part of the problem is that we're forced to represent break with a single vector. And so the best we can do is represent a kind of weighted global average of all of its senses. For items with a small number of highly related sentences, this is gonna be great, but for break, it is evidently a disaster. Now, maybe we could cleverly identify lots of these latent senses in this single vector, but I'm actually not sure how to go about doing that, right? So this looks like a real obstacle. 
If we turn to our summary card, the unavoidable problem here is that we're not paying attention to context, which is going to bum the linguist out for sure. Also, to round this out, I put this contemplating emoticon for discrete structured dimensions when it comes to these static models. The direct answer here is probably that the best of these models issue a no for this, this question. They don't offer discrete structured dimensions, but rather have a few dimensions and capture meaning as projections or of, mu of multiple dimensions. But I do grant that the co-occurrence matrix itself might be highly interpretable, right? The excellent and horrid columns are easy to understand in my toy example, and something like them could deliver direct and interpretable insights. It's just that the dimensionality reduction steps seem crucial to the success of these models because of the neighbors of neighbors idea, and that just destroys any simple notion of interpretability. So let's move on to contextual models, the final character in my story here, and the most important one when we think about inspiring lexical semanticists to get involved with this kind of research. I'd like to start with how these models represent tokens, which is something that we often skip past quickly, but it's worth meditating on this more than we usually do. For my example, I've got the sequence The Rock Rules, uh, but this is tokenized in a complex way by these models. Each token is accompanied by a positional token saying where it occurs in the string, and each token is also accompanied by a higher level positional encoding that captures something about where it occurs in the overall text, say as the premise for an argument or a context passage for answering a question. The gray vectors here are vectors that we look up in a regular embedding space, not like, unlike the one that we used for GloVe before. The positional and contextual encodings are also coming from their own separate embedding spaces. And then all three of these vectors are added up element-wise to deliver the representations in green here. And these are really the first representations in this model that we would consider to be word or token representations. And you can tell that the representation of each of these words is going to be different depending on where it might appear in the sentence, right? Even before we continue the process of building the full model, we know we have done something interestingly different than we had for GloVe even if the raw ingredients here are all regular embedding spaces. From there, of course, we do continue. And what I have here can be seen as like the BERT model. So we'll continue with potentially a lot of transformer blocks. And each transformer block has lots of parameters that tie together all of the representations that occur above each word. And so now we have a really supercharged notion of contextual representation where every word is influencing every other word and all the representations are getting updated based on this distributional information. By the same token, we're dealing with a supercharged notion of distributional similarity. So for BERT, the training procedure involves randomly masking out tokens and then trying to predict those tokens on the basis of the rest of the sequence. Now, this is a self-supervised classification process that updates all of the parameters pushing the model to prefer attested co-occurrence patterns over unattested ones. Once the training process is complete, we have a lot of representations that we can consider when doing lexical semantics. Each transformer block will have these output states that we can take to be a model of the entire input sequence. And changing even one part of the input is going to have a global impact on all of these representations due to how dense the interconnections are inside the transformer. By the way, this actually raises a complex question that we unfortunately won't have time to address, but let's throw it out there. The word the, for example, occurs in this sequence. Where should I look in BERT if I want to study the? We tend to look at the column above the target word, but that's not obviously correct, and it certainly isn't the only sensible thing we could do. For a word like the, which is highly variable depending on context and gets a lot of its content from its complement phrase syntactically, it might make sense to look more at the phrase level for its meaning or even just at the words following the. Uh, and that's something we can definitely do with these models and perhaps we should be doing more of it. Let me mention a few more general results just by way of spreading the word. These aren't our results, but they're exciting and suggest even more avenues for exploring break than I'll be able to take on in this talk. So Lorero et al. 2021 show that BERT is excellent for word sense disambiguation. I'm going to report some analyses that are inspired by their explorations. 
Uh, Balmasani et al. 2020 showed that you can derive robust static representations from contextual ones by averaging over a lot of context. So if you need something more like a glove space, then you can derive one that's even better than glove, arguably. And maybe it can even be seen as capturing something very abstract about the lexical unit, something more like a semantic lexicon derived from usage data. Tanny et al. 2019 and subsequent work on probing has shown that there is a ton of really interesting structure latent in BERT hidden representations, including a lot of relevant morphosemantic information that could guide lexical semantic work. And Papa Dimitrio et al. 2021 show that multilingual BERT embeds a robust multidimensional notion of grammatical subjecthood, which I think could be really exciting to explore further in the context of alternating verbs like English break. So we have a lot we can build on already, and I'm sure there's lots more inspiring work out there that linguists could make good use of and even participate in. Here's a plot from Lorero et al. to help you give you a sense for the potential here when it comes to doing lexical semantics in these contextual embedding spaces. The focus is the word square, and these authors process lots of texts that manifest different senses of square, and those senses re are reflected in the resulting contextual representations for this word. Right? These representations cluster intuitively based on semantics, and they may even capture underlying sense-spanning information related to like shared conceptual metaphors and the like that exist across these senses. Now, we did something similar for break. For a recent paper called Break Plus Theme Combinations and the Causative Alternation, Erica created a richly annotated dataset of break instances in corpora. And for the experiments here, we're going to be working with a subset of her cases, 458 break sentences from the Corpus of Contemporary American English, or COCA. In this dataset, each sentence has been annotated for the transitive-intransitive distinction, whether the usage seems metaphorical, the identity of the argument or arguments, the status of the example as causative or anti-causative, and also the meaning class. And we'll focus on the meaning classes here and make secondary use of the transitive-intransitive distinction. So the meaning classes that Erica identified in this work are given here. There are nine of these classes. And the core question we want to pose is whether these meaning classes are latent in the contextual representations of break in these sentences. I think the answer is a really interesting yes. To start, as a kind of initial check of this idea, we did some probing experiments where we just see whether the representation for break can be classified according to its meaning class annotation. Our probe model is an L2 regularized classifier with a cross entropy loss with a penalty chosen via cross validation on the train set. And here we're reporting macro F1 scores averaged across three uh, folds of cross validation. Ever since Hewitt and Leong 2019 were concerned not to overstate the power of the probe, so we also report selectivity scores, which are just the probe scores minus the performance of a, on a control task, which here is random assignment of break representations to meaning classes. You can see in these results that the earliest layers of the model are not very robust when it comes to this probing work, but that layer 12 is really very robust in this sense. So good, we have something to build on. What we actually want to do is explore this space in a more fluid way than the probe will allow. So here's a visualization of layer one of the break representations. We're just using an unsupervised method to display these vectors with no training of any kind on the meaning labels. And color corresponds to the meaning class, and a box around an example means that it's an intransitive use. Here at layer one, there isn't really much structure as far as I can tell, as we might expect from those probe numbers we reported. But layer 12 is a different story. By layer 12, we have a lot of rich structure. Indeed, to a first approximation, the model seems to have a highly structured view of these tokens that is nicely aligned with our meaning class labels. The green case is the only clear exception to this, but that's the unclassified group in Erica's annotation scheme, and I think our model can help us add some structure to that otherwise diffuse group. But first, it's notable that the model seems to be capturing the transitive-intransitive distinction at some level. For example, this known cluster here, right, the intransitive uses all fall together. It's also really illuminating to look at the outlier cases that seem like they got separated from their expected cluster. 
For example, here's an appear case that got nestled in among some very different senses. This appear case is the sentence sweat beads break on his forehead, which does seem to bring in dimensions of separation that are maybe different from the day broke and other clear appearance uses. This outlier case of decipher down here is also really cool. This example is the tribal dialects completely baffled the enemy who repeatedly tried but failed to break the codes. It's right next to this violate case, right? Uh, Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace found out what makes the risk worth it to break the sacred code of silence known as omerta. Right? These senses of break do have a lot in common, and we can see how both might be different from the decipher case up here that's among these other different cases. This one is, with some help, she managed to break the code and translate the message, which is more of a purely ending type scenario than this failure to break the code case down here. Also, I think we can make some progress, as I said, on the unclassified group uh, using this space. The cluster here is uh, the set of examples that use the collocation make or break. And this one here is the set of examples reporting on broken hearts in various ways. So I should wrap up, but that's good. Obviously, this is an incredibly rich feature space to explore, and there's really no hope of me being able to comprehensively report on it. But all of this seems like excellent initial fuel for rich linguistic investigations of a verb like break. So I'll turn now to wrapping up. Here's my scorecard, but let me just move to the final conclusions. I've grayed out the static representation column since it seems like less interesting given our goals as linguists. First, I want to point out these two lines of consensus. These are really important. Both linguists and NLPers at this point seem to have consensus that lexical meanings are high dimensional and modulated by context. This is already a ton of consensus that we should capitalize on more when doing interdisciplinary research here. Second, the different answers for the second two lines here strike me as an opportunity, especially for linguists. Models like BERT deliver deep, complex, interrelated structure that can be mined to discover new things. This won't necessarily impose category boundaries, though. Now, this aligns well with my own view of the universe, but I grant that there is room for debate, but it's definitely worth debating. Building on that, the question of whether words exist independently of their tokens. With contextual models, we can abstract out a fixed lexicon if we choose, but we can also choose tokens or uses as our primary object of study. This possibility is not really available within the confines of standard semantic theory, but NLP seems like it's providing the tools that we would need to build theories of the sort of semantics that would be based entirely in individual instances of use. And this might emphasize more what is actually communicated between people and de-emphasize purely representational aspects of these theories. And this strikes me as incredibly expansive and inspiring. And so let me just end there. Thank you.